Welcome to The Woman's Connection. I'm Barry Louise Switzen, your moderator. The Woman's Connection is a program about events shaping women's lives and helping one gain authentic power on a personal or a professional level. So won't you stay tuned? Welcome. Money. How do you save it? How do you invest? But we all know how to spend it. With me is Jane Bryant Quinn. And we're going to find out how to maximize our dollars as far as saving for today and for tomorrow. And I would like to welcome Jane Bryant Quinn. Jane, thank you for joining me. Nice to be here. Why don't you just start off and tell us a little bit about your background because you've been all over the place. Well, I went to college and I'm actually an American literature major. I'm not a finance major, but um, I've always wanted to be a reporter. It's the only thing I ever wanted to be. And I came to New York after college to get a job. I started in the mail room at Newsweek. Ah. <laughs> I sorted the mail. I did it very well, the A, the B, the C. And then I went to work for a little newsletter that was publishing the, that was covering the consumer finance movement, the whole developing kind of consumer movement. And I was the new person in and no one else wanted to do the money stories. So they assigned them to me. And I thought they were fabulous. <laughs> I got interested. I started reading and talking to people, learning. I started working with my own paltry salary. And uh, step by step, I started learning what I was doing. And I just love this work. I think it's constantly fascinating. Well, it seems like you, well, you've written a lot of books. I have. Mm -hmm. But your most current one is Smart and Simple Financial Stra Strategies for Busy People. And I think that takes care of 99% of the population. Do you know we are all so busy? Everybody you talk to says, you know, 10 years ago it wasn't like this. You know, with work and with kids and, and with whatever you do on the side. I mean, it's just, everybody's frantic. And then they put off handling their money because they think, I'm too busy, I'll do it tomorrow, it's too confusing, I haven't got the time to think about it. And the truth is that there are so many simple things you can do with your money that will work so you can set it up, you can have your busy life, but once it's set up, it will run automatically. This is my dream financial plan. Runs automatically so you can get on with the rest of your life and not have to worry about your money. All right. How do you get started? <laughs> well, let's see. You get started, you know, most people will say get out of debt. And obviously, I say get out of debt, too. But, you know, I don't think that's where you start. I think you start with saving money for yourself. There is nothing like having the habit of saving. And I was very slow to come to this because I had a paltry salary. And you're living paycheck to paycheck and you think you can't possibly save, which was certainly me in my 20s. I was a single mother at the time and they didn't pay women a lot in those days. And, um, and somebody at my company said, have you signed up for the company? you know, thrift savings plan. And I said, are you kidding? I can't pay the dentist. <laughs> I can't do this. And he was at me and at me and at me. And I finally said, okay, okay. Take 5% of my paycheck. I'll put it in the company plan, knowing that I wouldn't make it and that I would reverse it. And I put it in. And you know what happened? Nothing happened. And I discovered the magic. This is the only true magic in personal finance. If you take money out of your paycheck, and put it away, you live on what's left. And you don't have to budget for it, you don't have to do anything. It just happens. You never know what it is you didn't buy, you live on what's left. And so this is what I really want people to do. I want them to start by, if you have a company 401k plan, you're not putting anything in, put in 5%, just start with it. If you're putting something in already, put in 5% more. If you don't have a company plan, Go to your bank or go to a mutual fund and start an individual retirement account and have 5% taken out of your checking account every single month automatically. You will live on what's left, your standard of living won't change, and you will start building savings for yourself. 
That's marvelous. Now, after I put my five percent of yes. my salary into the savings now account. Now we go to your to your debts. Right? <laughs> I, ju I just think the habit of saving is so important that I, I put that first. Then uh, so many people have credit card debt when of course you're paying interest on. You know if you just weren't paying interest on your credit card debt and you put that into savings think how well off you'd be. Well I so, think a lot of people don't realize how much they're paying the percentage it's what, 16, 24 percent? Well, if you've missed a payment, it might be 24 percent. It could even be as high as 30 percent. You might start out with a 16 percent card, but if you miss a payment or you miss two payments, just like that, they'll put you up to 24, 26, 30 percent. And even though you start paying, it may take six to 12 months to get out of that hole. So, so t see what your debts are. Right. First, see what the interest rate is. See how much you owe. You know, a lot of people don't even want to face that. You know, adding it all up is very painful. And then say, okay, these are the debts that are a lower rate debt. I mean, maybe you have a student loan, for example. That's a nice low rate debt. And then these are the debts that are the high rate debts. And set up an automatic payment program out of your checking account. Say, I'm going to put, after you put your 5% in your savings, say I'm going to put another 5% toward paying off my debts. And it's going to happen automatically, every single month, and those debts will start going down, down, down. And you pay the minimum on your low rate debts, and you pay more than you think you can afford on your high rate debts, and you'll start seeing them reduce. And then you shop with cash, or you shop with a debit card. You know, it's very convenient to carry a little plastic debit card, and you can debit card takes money automatically out of your bank account, and so it's like shopping with cash. And here's another little magic. Okay. All the studies show that if you shop with cash, you spend less, and it's not any you know. What is it? You know, you see a pair of shoes and you have a credit card. Shoes are my weakness. You have a credit card. You say, ah, oh, I want those nice red heels. And, but if you have to put down a debit card, you have to put down cash, you pass the window and say, maybe not this time. And all the studies have shown that's another wonderful way of reducing your spending because you won't spend as much if you're not shopping on credit. And I shop on credit because I want my frequent flyer miles and oh, everything. Oh, I do too. No, I think, I mean, I think credit cards are terrific. And I shop on them, but I pay off at the end of the month. You probably do the same thing. I do. So painful as it is, painful I do. Painful as it is. So you use your credit card and pay off at the end of the month, and you get your frequent flyer or your catalog points or whatever it is you want. That's great. But if you're talking about people who have let their debt build up, now you're talking about a situation where what's important before you get your frequent flyer points. You can't afford to use them. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so before you get the points, you need to work down and get rid of those consumer debts. And the way to do it is to set up automatic payments and to shop with cash or a debit card until it's over. You know, the money you spend on interest is like feeding money to the squirrels. You know, why would you do that? It's just you get fat squirrels and you get a thin wallet. <laughs> so. Compounding the interest that you earn on your money plus the dividends if you do dividend reinvestment. That just keeps helping you to build and build and build. Absolutely. And so, and if you have it going in automatically into, into a retirement, into savings, into a right. retirement plan, you know, you don't even notice it. The thing to do is to set it up, let it run automatically, and then forget about it. Do your job, see your kids, see your friends, go to the movies, and just have this machine working automatically for you. And when I talk about smart and simple strategies, this is the kind of thing I mean. And by the way, this is the kind of thing I do. Because certainly back when I was living paycheck to paycheck, as I said, I learned that it worked. And I put in the 5%, and then when I was astonished to see that I still wasn't paying the dentist, I have to say. I mean, I was still living paycheck to paycheck. I was just saving something to my amazement. I went to 7% and nothing changed. I went to 10%. So by the time I was in my late 20s, I was actually at 10% savings. Just stepping up bit by bit by bit. And, and it just didn't change my life. Well, let's jump forward a bit. Baby boomers are turning 60, all right? A lot of them are in the situation where the company that they've been working for all their lives no longer is in existence. They're being downsized. 
their pensions are disappearing. What can they do? Do you know, I've said there are certain magic things in personal finance. Automatic savings is right. one of them. There's some things that are not magic. If you are 60 and you have not saved any money and your paycheck stops, you're stuck. So I mean, this is some, I, nobody can wave a wand and suddenly create a huge re retirement savings for yourself. So obviously people are working later because they don't have the savings, so they're counting on keeping their jobs. And many people do, or they work part time. You get Social Security, you work part time, or you get another job. People are going to be working easily until they're 70 simply because they haven't saved enough money. But you know, a lot of people then can't do that. As you said, they may lose their jobs, their companies may close, uh, maybe their health is bad. You know, they think they're going to work until they're 70, and then they come down with something that prevents them from working. So, so I guess I don't want to discourage people who are 60 because it always pays to save, but, but part of your financial plan when you're 60 is diet and exercise <laughs> because you're going to have to keep your health. But if you're in your 20s now, you should be saving that 5% working up to 10. If you're in your 30s, you should absolutely be saving 10% of your paycheck. And if you're in your 40s, you should be up to 15%. And so speaking to the younger boomers, <laughs> say, look at what's happened to the older boomers and what they're facing. And you can change that if you do something now. Well, let's just talk about the 40-year-olds. A lot of them are not quite the sandwich generation, but they're getting close to it, where they have young kids that they have to save for college. They have senior parents and they're helping them. What advice would you have for them? Um, save for yourself first. Okay. Um, if you, when you have kids that you, if you want to help with their college, that's fine. But save after you are putting that 15% in your own retirement plan. Because if you borrow to put your kids through school and, and then you retire and you're broke, who are you going to turn to for help? You're going to turn to your kids the same way the parents are turning to them now. And you know you don't like it if you have to support your parents. I mean, you love your parents, but it's a terrible burden that parents would put on you if they, in fact, need your financial support. Emotional support is something else. You know, Obviously, we're all going to give our parents as much emotional care and support as we can. But when you're talking about writing the check out of your earnings, that gets really hard. And you really don't want to, re if you're doing that, you don't want to repeat that for your own kids. You become and, resentful. And too. you become resentful. And you know, it's not only your parents, it's your spouse's parents. You know, what, you know, I mean, you're sitting at the table saying, well, who shall we give money to, your mother or mine? You know, this is very hard. It is a very difficult, it's hard in families, and you are resentful. So my feeling is that save for yourself. And if you, and tell your kids, if you, don't let your kids think they're going to go to a, a big school that you can't afford. A lot of kids kind of grow up with that because parents don't want to face it. You know, they just don't want to tell them. They say, oh, go where you want, darling, <laughs> sort of thing. <laughs> if kids are going to go, to, there's some wonderful community colleges. If kids are going to go to community college, they should know that. If they're going to go to, to SUNY, I mean, two of my kids graduated from SUNY Albany. You know, it's a great school. <laughs> and it's not as expensive as a big private school. So you need to sort of think about what your kids' expectations are, and you need to save for yourself. And then if you have something left and you want to save for your kids, you know, New York has a terrific, you know, these, these 529 plans where you uh, can put in money for college and it will accumulate in mutual funds, and then it comes out tax-free when it's used for higher education. And, and you can find them at savingforcollege.com is the website. It's got all the state you know, college places, where you go, how you save. And I think it's a wonderful way to save for college, but after you save for yourself. If you save for your children to go to college, isn't there such a thing as having too much money that you can't get assistance for college for your children? You're on that borderline? Do you know, that is, to me, just something that upsets me because, uh, yes, you can be at a place where the, the savings that you have may slightly, slightly mm -hmm. diminish the amount of college aid you get. 
But the college aid first is probably in the form of a loan. Oh. It's very, I mean, it could be in the form of a grant, but it is most likely to come in the form of a student loan. So, okay, you, you say, I'm going to save less. On the gamble, I'll get more college aid. The college aid may come in the form of a loan, and there you are with a bigger debt. At, at most, uh, certainly now, because the law is changing January uh, 1st on these five various types of five, July 1st, on these various types of 529 plans, at most they will say, the plan should be held in the parent's name, not in the kid's name. And in the most, they will say five, five and a half percent of it is going, uh, is going to be considered available for college and the rest isn't. And you know, how much student aid is this going to diminish? I mean, people just drive themselves crazy this way. What you need to do is say, I'm going to save for my kid for college. <laughs> and don't try to imagine you're going to finagle the system. You've started saving the five percent. 7%, 10%. Do you leave it sit there and just in a savings account, or do you start coming up with different ways to maximize the amount of money, like stocks, bonds, mutual yeah. funds? Um, I feel very strongly that people should not be buying individual stocks. Uh, I mean, that's everybody thinks, oh, I have to invest. I need to go out and buy this company or that company. First, they get very confused about it. Second, you have no idea what's going on in the company. I mean, look at Enron, look at WorldCom, look at Lucent. I mean, look at all these companies that everybody thought was a great company and they went down 90% in the crash. I, I don't buy individual stocks. And I know a lot about the market and things. I don't buy them because I have been around enough to know that I have no idea what's going on inside a company. I have no way of getting the timing right, of knowing, you know, is, is this stock suddenly going to go down? What's going to happen to them? I have no idea. And again, you know, this, this smart and simple financial strategies, this is the way I run my life. I believe in simplicity, and I believe in not having to worry or having to think about the money all the time. And with stocks, you have to worry and think about it all the time. You have to trade. Is this a good time to sell? There's a certain type of mutual fund which is actually uh, pretty new, newly packaged. I love these mutual funds. They're called, the general name is called a target retirement fund or a lifestyle fund. Oh, this is new. And the, oh, this is new. It's about, it's about 10 years old, a life cycle fund, about 10 years old. And what they do, and, and this, by the way, this is the fastest growing type of mutual fund in the country, because when people see it, they say, oh, this will work. This is what this is what happens. Um, they're they're set up by date, and you say, "What year will I be 65?" Okay. And maybe it's 20, 2020 or 2030 or you know 2040 or 2025, whatever it is. They're all labeled by the year, and you say, "Okay, I'm going to be 65 in 2030." You buy the fund called 2030. When you're younger. It is substantially invested in stocks. As you grow older, it gradually gets more conservative, which is just the way a high-priced professional would handle your money if you could afford to pay a high-priced professional to do it, except this all happens automatically inside the mutual fund. So it might be 80% in stocks when you're 30. By the time you're 65, you just keep on holding on to this fund. You do nothing. You go and live the rest of your life and you know, have fun and work and see your kids. You totally ignore it. When you're 65, it will probably be, oh, 60% in stocks and 40% in bonds, which is just what you should be when you're 65. You keep on holding it. When you're 80, it's an income fund. It is absolutely a lifetime fund with these wonderful they call asset allocation, so much to stocks, so much to bonds, pegged to what your age is, and, they, and they're very low cost. They're, uh, they're, they're coming up very fast in 401k plans. A lot of companies are starting to use them. Huge demand because people have been mismanaging their 401ks and losing money. And the big time. Oh, big time, and the companies are worried about it. This is now their whole retirement. So they're, they're starting to add these funds in 401ks because they're simple and they're good and they work. And you can also, if you buy them yourself in, in you know, an individual retirement account or just plain old buy them, um, 
There are three mutual fund groups that, again, I recommend in the book. They're low cost. They're very easy to deal with. Uh, Vanguard and T. Rowe Price and Fidelity. And you can just buy that. It's buy and forget. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> it's just I mean, these are wonderful things. And, and, and you say, well, they, some people say, oh, well, the funds are new. How do we know? But the funds aren't new because what they do is, if you have a Vanguard life cycle fund, what they do is they invest in other Vanguard funds that have long histories. So what's important is that if you go to a professional, and they would put you in just this kind of thing a lot in stocks when you're young, you know, 50-50 in, in bond stocks when you're retiring, mostly in bonds when you're older. So this is, this is a long time, well-established system of investing, and they package it all together. And Vanguard, I think it's like 0.2% a year to manage. It's cheap, it's good, it's simple, and I love it. <laughs> there are so many simple things you can do. People just get buffaloed because there's so much out there and it's expensive and salespeople come to you and say, you know, do this, You're do that. overwhelmed. And you're you overwhelmed. Have, besides putting it into your 401k or a Roth IRA or something like that where you're earning interest on your interest and everything's compounding and you're not taxed on it until you take it out, if that's the case, would you recommend it for a regular account? Oh, sure. Oh, no, okay. absolutely. Without question. Once again, if you, outside of retirement account, if you had a pot of money and you went to a professional and said, please manage this for me, this is just exactly what he or she would do with it. <laughs> They'd put okay. more in stocks when you're younger and 50-50 when you're 65. And that's just the way they would handle it. And these, uh, these mutual funds do it for you at just a fraction of the cost. Now, what about TIPS, the Treasury Inflation Protection Savings? What is your feeling on that? Um, these are treasury bonds. They are super safe. They're, the interest they pay is linked to inflation. So they have a, a fixed interest rate they pay every year plus an inflation adjustment every year. So it's a, a way to absolutely totally preserve your purchasing power if there's future inflation. You're not going to get be ahead of inflation. You're not going to be behind it. You're just going to preserve your purchasing power, which is great for part of your money. The only thing about these is that they are, um, there's some phantom income involved. And this is what I mean. The, the interest that is the inflation adjustment gets added on paper. You aren't paid it, but you have to pay taxes on it. So you want to put it so in you a want retirement to, this, account. You must have these in a retirement account to avoid tax complications. And if I may go back to my talk about these life cycle target retirement funds, they have partly in, um, in a variety of stock mutual funds. They have a variety of bond mutual funds. They include tips. They include these inflation adjusted bonds as part of the allocation of money they put in bonds. So you've got treasuries and corporate bonds and these special inflation adjusted bonds, all in these magical funds I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that always baffles me is that there's so much material out on finances. You write a column for Newsweek and Good Housekeeping. What other periodicals? would be good to keep up to date with financial, the finances. There are two very good magazines that are written for the average person and that are terrific on all manner of personal finances, you know, saving, insuring, investing, all kinds of stuff. One is Money Magazine, mm -hmm. which is published by Time Inc., which is a very good magazine. And the other is called Kiplinger's Personal Finance. It's published out of Washington by Kiplinger. You can find these things on the web very easily. Those are two. I read both of them cover to cover all the time. I'm always ripping things out and underlining things. They're two excellent magazines that really, really help people understand some of the choices they have to make about money. But you know, Mary, the choices are not as complicated or as hard as people think. This is because we talked before, there's so much stuff out there, your mind goes blank and you just feel baffled. But if you, but you don't need 99% of what's out there. And once you get in your head that you don't need it, there are just a few simple things you need. You need your company <laughs> savings plan. You need a target retirement fund. You need a, a 529 for your kid if you're going to help with college. You need to get out of debt. You need term life insurance if you have a family to protect. That's it. How complicated is that? What about long-term 
care insurance. Long-term care insurance is a, a product that 10, 15 years ago I was saying I don't think so because they weren't very good, they weren't reliable, the companies were raising you know, raising premiums 30, 50, 80 percent, people weren't able to pay. It was really very bad. Now I think the products are very good and I think that that when you are in your late 50s, early 60s, that's a time to start asking yourself if you want long-term care insurance. Um, it is expensive still, so if you have just an average income, it's probably very hard to afford long-term care insurance, although you can cut the price by saying, I'll have this policy, but I'll wait six months before it pays. You know, if you want it to pay right away, so it's going to cost a lot more. So right. there are ways you can cut the price. Um, if you are you know, super wealthy, you obviously don't need it. If you have a lower, medium to lower income, uh, you won't be able to afford it, but that is what the Medicaid program is for. They, if you don't have the assets and you need nursing home coverage, they are paying for it still, one hopes, that continues. <laughs> but, I mean, that's simply, that's just a fact of life. So it's really people who are in the upper middle income range who are having to ask themselves this question, can they afford it now? I think that if you are single, I wouldn't bother with it because whatever assets you have will go to pay for your nursing home and when you run out of assets, Medicaid will pay. But if you're married and then there's a question of if you're fine and your spouse is not and your spouse has to go into a nursing home, that can be very draining. And so in that case, I think you should at least take a look at it to see if you can afford it. Jean, I can't tell you how wonderful this is. In the closing moments of the show, <laughs> what would you like to leave the audience with? I'd like to say that, that it is not difficult to do smart things with money. That there's really a very short list of things that work. They are low cost. They are things you can understand and manage, which is very important. You can understand them. And you can set them up so they will run automatically. And then you can get on with the rest of your life. And that's really why I wrote this book, because this is the way I run my own money. And this is the way I think that, that people need to do. This book is my short list of what I think are the best things to do that you can do easily and that you can set up and you can run yourself. Thank you Thank so you. much. It's been <laughs> terrific. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've learned quite a few new things tonight. Love to hear from you. Bye now.